انا رحت انضم في مره رحت انضم في مره لقله مندسه بالتهميش والظلم عمرها ما كانت حاسه انا رحت انضم في مره رحت انضم في مره لقله مندسه بالتهميش والظلم عمرها ما كانت حاسه لقيت خلق كتيره طول مصر بناسها بتعيجي مليون وبيزيدوا لسه في عيني على القله يا ليلي very important and timely discussion about uh, the political situation in Egypt, which we have called, which <laughs> my dear friend and colleague uh, Hesham Salam has called the containment of politics in Egypt. And I think the reasons why we're using those words um, will become apparent to you uh, when we hear the remarkable collection of speakers that we have today. Uh, this is another in a series of seminars that's sponsored by the Program on Arab Reform and Democracy of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. Thank you so much, Larry, and thank you for having me. Um, I think the, the title of, uh, of the panel cannot be more appropriate and accurate for the situation right now in Egypt in terms of the political dynamics. And uh, it's, I would think of it in order to make sense of what's going on right now, I think a structural analysis would be appropriate because as you see over the past five years, the change of particular personalities and ethics, they did not really change much in what's going on within the, the street or in public space uh, or how people are interacting together. I think the two main slight differences that we can see, uh, if we can explain the significant changes in the form of governance, is the military coming to the forefront. Yes, they were always there, but right now it's more obvious and and blunt and clear. And the second thing is the slight difference between the time of America right now is the difference between power and control. So if we may say at the time of the regime had the authoritarian power or the power over managing resources or even having the power over forging policies and directing policies into, for example, privatization in terms of economy or other forms of policies that affect the form of government. But the regime right now is more focused on to rather than power but control, which is preventing people from any public engagement at all. If we think of the parliamentary elections of 2005, we had the number of brothers spreading about 80 which is about 20 percent uh, of the parliament. I'm sure we are going to be better person to talk about this, but still, if we see the difference from about more than 10 years ago, there's more and more closing down of the, of the political space, political engagement. And the, the process that they uh, exercise this control is very systematic. But it, it, again, it's the same way of the past regime, but it's more pronounced and, and more obvious, which is uh, we can see as uh, uh, three ways of control. It's like controlling the narrative and then moving into oppressive practices and then turning into oppressive laws. So to give you an example, the, the civil society and NGOs, they started by Spreading the narrative in the media, uh, the smear campaign that everyone who's working with foreign organizations or uh, um, even engaging with foreign, uh, foreign governments of foreign organizations or agents of the West and uh, they're out to destroy the country. So setting up the narrative through the media that this is the case and then turning into oppressive practices, which is the prosecution and then going into the arrest and the intimidation and then turning into the law and trying to change the law and make it like changing the penal code and penalties and changing even the, um, the, the, the prison sentences. So it's the same way also from the demonstration law. It started by saying that everyone who goes to the street is trying to destabilize the country and the country cannot tolerate these uh, protests anymore. They're ineffective, but also destructive. And then we go to the practice, which is the arrest and imprisonment and um, uh, right now we have the first disappearance and then changing it into a law. 
as, as the demonstration one goes into the cycle. The same thing with the, with the terrorism. Uh, uh, holding or labeling anyone who's in opposition as a terrorist or a, an extremist, and then going into the arrest and the crackdown, and then moving into issuing the chat as well. So, going into the systematic way or a form of control, and right now it's very obvious that we then uh, we're choosing the people who are uh, in power, for example, the Ministry of Interior, bringing back from the time, Nabi Abdullah, who was the head of the state security, also very telling him to. The idea of having the preemptive intelligence is such a temporary government, just like no one collecting information about you even before you start acting. So, this I think is an obvious way of closing down of the political space and prevention of any form of political engagement. Um, just to uh, try to sum this and look at this in the, in the current situation. And I think there are challenges and opportunities for the regime and challenges and opportunities at the same time for uh, the civil forces, for uh, the, the forces calling for change or reform. I think the biggest challenge for the regime right now is the security situation. Yes, uh, there is an inflated narrative in, uh, in the media. However, the security situation is really dire. For example, the rate of attacks right now is 82 attacks per month. Uh, compared to 2014, it was 25 at that time, which is actually a failure of the fire that was in the inability to combat terrorism and they claim that they are, this is their mission, and that's why they're breaking out um, from some opposition. And the second challenge, I think, is the uh, division or the crack of the um, uh, strong pack that was formed around the dream churches, and uh, most of the forces that were there behind. Uh, CC or, or the, uh, the military at that time are just like, getting more diluted and more loose. And I think the third thing is the economy because um, the effect of the mega project uh, will diminish at some point. And it's, just, it's mostly about the, the media impact, the propaganda that goes about the, the, um, the desire to show that there is an achievement out there. But actually, this may have an effect only for so long, but at some point, the, the deteriorating economic situation will have an impact on people. So these are the main challenges for the regime right now. The opportunities, of course, in maintaining the status quo is the fatigue that is happening, the inability of people to organize. Um, and at the same time, it's the centralization of the regime approach to government. Well, this actually has a, a, an advantage and disadvantage to regime. The, the first advantage is like it's centralized, controlling everything. However, uh, this centralization would uh, create a situation where all the blame for any problem or any challenge up to the presidency. Uh, maybe right now, after the formation of the parliament, that uh, would be a little bit have, will have a dilution effect, but still. This, the centralized form of government can actually be a burden on the regime rather than on the opportunity. Concerning the, the civil forces or the forces going for a change or performance, um, the challenge is mainly coming from the regional dynamics because there is a fear in it. Also, again, the same narrative of the we don't want to get to be Syria and Iraq. We're seeing the dismantling and deterioration of the situation, the images of the refugees, and uh, the breaking down of the state. So, this, and the, the Egyptian regime is using this narrative um, to its advantage and their ability to crack down further on any form of opposition. And it's actually affecting also international policymakers right now. Uh, if you go uh, to talk to any policymakers in DC, Egypt is not even on the agenda. It's not an interest. They don't want to hear about it anymore. Except it's like we want to maintain the status quo. So this is a challenge for all the people who are uh, the, the, the local places who are trying to push for change. And then the second challenge, of course, is the fragmentation, the inability to forge alliances and the lack of resources because, again, it became you know, penalizing any form of receiving funding or support or connections with the West. It's like there is this isolationist approach that the government has succeeded to create, even if uh, later on they did not create pressure on NGOs or civil society, but at the end of the day, they reached a point where people are self-centering or closing their organizations down out of fear of 
place in the same space. The opportunities are really for, uh, for us or for um, uh, places going for a change is, I think the only opportunity is that with all of these buildings, they don't care so much about the image of those. And that could be our window of opportunity to use that to maintain pressure, to continue to open the space further, and trying to uh, challenge the kind of narrative that the government is propagating and, um, and spreading around. Uh, because that, this, the open and the alternative narrative will actually help us open an actual space. Politics. I, I decided to go in, in, in three different directions to highlight how politics, uh, how political uh, interactions in Egypt are being contained. And later on to reflect a bit on who is containing uh, politics. Because once again, I guess if we continue to operate using a uh, homogenous uh, category of the regime, we will not be able to understand the current dynamics at least uh, different aspects of the current dynamics cannot be understood well. Now, in containing politics, I, I would start by outlining three different processes. One is control. The second one is what I would describe as ridiculing politics, ridiculing politics and the business of politics in Egypt. And finally, criminal, criminalizing political engagement. Now, control, Nancy spent uh, some time describing how they control, how, how the establishment, how the ruling establishment around the current president um, uh, controls politics. I would, I would, I would basically categorize their measures and policies uh, in, 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 in two different uh, categories. One, uh, legal tools, where you have constitutional legal uh, amendments that have been introduced throughout the last two years to uh, ensure uh, the establishment's control uh, over politics. You have legal and constitutional measures ranging from uh, drafting and passing a constitutional text in which the military establishment, in fact, is put in a position of a state above the state, or in which no oversight uh, with regard to the security apparatus can be pushed forward uh, from a, an elected parliament. But as well in passing different uh, laws and amendments to the penal code primarily, uh, where, where um, uh, Egyptian activists refer to some of these laws and amendments as everything would uh, be possible laws. So where you can target opposition activists, where you can target young uh, Egyptians, where you can target students and, and, and not only defame them, but put them on the basis of trumped up charges and let them face um, uh, different, different uh, measures of legal punishment. One of the most dangerous legal changes which were introduced to Egypt is um, uh, cancellation of the time limit of prov prov provisional detention. So as of now, according to different independent NGOs, we have uh, anywhere between 40,000, 50,000 Egyptians detained. Most of them are detained based on provisional, provisional detention, where some of them have been detained for two years and they are yet to face any trials. So you detain, you keep in prisons, you read announcements if you monitor Egyptian newspapers. Uh, those of you who, who monitor them would read uh, systematically announcements by the government that new prisons are being built. This is an indication of overfilled prisons uh, due to uh, primary uh, huge number of provisionally detained Egyptians. So you have legal, legal and constitution and legal measures which are being int introduced. Secondly, to control, you have uh, um, an almost a near to monopoly of the security apparatus. And, and here's a reference it to the Ministry of Interior, but of course to the intelligence community as well, where we uh, see different key events uh, in formal politics, such as a referendum to pass a constitution, such as parliamentary elections, or the lead up to the parliamentary elections. And if you look at the current parliament, which in fact started yesterday, its first session, it's basically a parliament that has been composed under the, not only the distant, but under the very direct control of the security apparatus with its two branches, the Ministry of Interior, State Security, and the intelligence uh, community. To the extent that pe people commenting, journalists, independent journalists or activists commenting on it would outline and refer to different parliamentarians as belonging to which 
uh, branch within the security apparatus. Uh, X, Y, and Z coming from the state security, um, uh, a corresponding number coming from, from uh, general intelligence, and so on and so forth. So you have two, in general, you have two tools which are used by the establishment to impose control uh, over uh, what used to be a vibrant and pluralist, of course with great deficits, but a vibrant and pluralist political scene between 2011 and 2013, constitution and legal uh, measures, as well as direct control uh, by the security apparatus. Of course, in comparison to the security apparatus, uh, all civilian institutions within the state apparatus, the relevance uh, has been eroding clearly. Uh, you hardly read about them. Egyptians do not read about what they do. Egyptians encounter the president or the security apparatus and their representatives, even in daily news. Second, second, uh, cat second um, uh, process which I would like to out outline is what I refer to as ridiculing politics. I believe one of the major tools, w w and, and here is a second component, Nan Nancy referred to the dominant narrative of the regime as a narrative constructed around, well, look around you and you should fear uh, Egypt slipping in the same direction like Syria and Iraq. So, so fear tactics, conventional fear tactics, tactics which are not new to Egypt. Mubarak used them very effectively, Sadat used them very effectively, Nasser used them very effectively as well, depending on the regional situation. And of course, with varying categories of enemies, um, uh, varying categories of who stands on the other side of, uh, of the aisle. But it's not only about that part of the narrative. A second key component is basically to suggest to Egyptians that politics is a business which will never bring bread and butter to Egyptians, to Egyptian families when they meet after their waking days to settle uh, their issues. So politics as a business which is not relevant uh, from a bread and butter perspective. And that that is an issue which is quite, quite interesting to, to, to look at its dynamics because who comes in, in replacement of politics is basically the military establishment, the one institution which can deliver bread and butter to Egyptians, to Egyptian families uh, when they meet for lunch or dinner, is a military establishment. It's not politics, it's not formal politics, and not any institution which is centered around that formal political sphere. It's not parliament, it's not the different ministries, it's not the state bureaucracy even, it's the one mighty establishment, the military establishment which is uh, in charge of um, uh, offering bread and butter. And therefore, if you monitor once again Egyptian um, events in the last, even the, in the very last few weeks, you see announcements by the government to control prices of different um, uh, consumer goods. But who is in charge of the factual control? It's a military establishment, which stands out, which has outposts, it's literally outposts selling um, uh, vegetables and fruits and different consumer goods at lower prices. So the translation, the implementation of that policy of uh, control uh, the price of consumer goods is left to the military establishment to do. It is um, um, uh, not, not only looking at, uh, at, uh, at the short run, but at the long run, it's um, a process of ridiculing politics and discrediting civilian institutions which are part of any formal political sphere. Finally, the, the last process I would refer to in, in, in relation to containment is criminalizing uh, independent political engagement. And criminalizing independent political engagement, um, uh, targeted groups are students, young Egyptians, as well as workers. And I understand uh, Joel will, will speak in detail about um, uh, workers and their uh, protest uh, activities. But it's interesting to look that the current establishment um, uh, has been operating using um, a mixture of uh, the old regime of the Mubarak regime uh, techniques and some techniques which are really uh, could be dated back to the 1950s and 1960s. So to, the, to, to an extent, criminalizing political, uh, independent political engagement um, uh, takes um, uh, the pat different patterns which Mubarak did use. You have um, uh, security um, uh, public and private security institutions, institutions and firms, uh, penetrating Egyptian universities. Uh, students uh, get arrested in universities, not outside of universities. Uh, students get harassed and um, uh, repressed in universities, not outside of universities. You have uh, what Nancy was referring to as a re relation to civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations in general. And, of course, you have um, um, uh, repressive measures targeted to workers, active workers. But you as well, 
um, uh, do see an attempt of re-establishing an overall state or ruling establishment grip uh, over universities, over young uh, Egyptians and their movements, and of course over the workers and their movements. So you have announcements which are styled in a, in, a, in a fashion very similar to what we used to have in the 1950s and 1960s. The president announced yesterday an initiative to employ and uh, progress the cause of young Egyptians. So you have the state coming in. So you, first of all, you, 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 you basically uh, push aside uh, your competitors, your quote-unquote independent competitors, using different methods of rep rep repression and harassment, and then you come in by a state-sponsored, a state-sponsored grant suggestion, an initiative, a presidential initiative to um, uh, promote the cause of young Egyptians. Secondly, on, on, uh, on workers, you have, um, in fact, reviving the old structures which used to exist since the 1950s and 1960s of a general um, uh, union for Egyptian uh, workers, and you see the same figures who used to control that general union uh, for workers, who used to control it uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, and even in the last years under Mubarak, coming back to life and, and penetrating that sphere. Or you look at what's happening in Parliament once again. You take Parliament not in any pluralist direction, but you make it uh, be you, you, you make it be composed and 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 conf co co configured around uh, the different um, uh, not competing centers of the security uh, establishment. So control, um, uh, criminalization, and ridiculing politics are the tools which are used to contain uh, to contain what used to be a vibrant and pluralist political space. Um, uh, finally, um, on the ruling establishment itself, because once again, um, I, I, I hate to, 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 to operate using uh, homogenous uh, or um, a monolithic understanding of what the ruling establishment uh, is, because at least I believe we can differentiate between four different key groups. And one of these groups would, I guess, um, go in an, opposite, in an opposite direction to what Nancy was saying in relation to civil forces. Because I believe when I look at Egypt today, I see four components of the ruling establishment. One is definitely the military establishment, whose representative is once again, as it has always been the case since 1952, uh, is sitting in the presidential palace. And the second, and of course, not only that they have the representative in the presidential palace, I mean, of course, you have to look at it from an economic and social perspective as well. You have an expansion of the role of the military establishment in the Egyptian economy, in different uh, societal fields. I was just referring to uh, ridiculing politics, discrediting civilian institutions, and the military to come in. Of course, it, 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 it takes you ultimately to one of the directions which Nancy was outlining of, well, you are exposing yourself way too much as well. I mean, if you cannot control the prices, uh, popular anger will hit the military establishment and no one else because you, you, you are promising way too much. But at any rate, you have the military uh, with an, expand, an expand, uh, expanding role in, 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 in different key societal sectors. You have the security apparatus, which is back to, uh, pra to, to basically implement revenge. And, and, and to a great extent, it's not only revenge against 2011, but it's revenge against the very idea of opening up even since 2005. So in a way, when you listen to and monitor the official discourse, it really does not wish to take Egypt back to uh, Jan January 24th, 2011. It's really way before 2005, even not allowing any tiny spot for expression of uh, free expression of opinion or for political engagement. So an uh, Kifaya movement, which we did see in, in 2004 and all the way to 2011, cannot, cannot be formed and operate legally in the current situation. The third component of, uh, of the ruling establishment is the state bureaucracy, which employs as of now over 7 million Egyptians, uh, and now in fact multiplied by their families, and they have stakes in the regime, and they have been playing a key role in pushing Egypt back to where, uh, where autocracy has always been. So it's, it's, it's uh, the state bureaucracy and its, um, um, its significance as well. Finally, um, economic and financial elites, uh, and and here here I come to civil forces because I, re I, I apart from 
referring to young Egyptians and their movements, informal networks of activists or uh, young Egyptian students and their informal networks, once again, I do not see civil forces operating in any uh, oppositional sense to the existing regime. Civil forces, uh, if classified as parties, uh, have been buying into the new autocracy and have been benefiting from the new autocracy. Once again, parties and party members uh, were given shares in parliament, a bit of seats were distributed among them as well. But even more dangerous, you cannot imagine, at least myself, I cannot imagine of civil forces operating in such a tough environment and to create opportunities or benefit from opportunities unless they are backed or supported or endorsed by economic and financial elites or segments of the economic and financial elites. And here we come to one of the most problematic symptoms of the current Egyptian autocracy, which is that most majorities of the financial and economic elites ha have decided to buy into the autocracy as well to secure its benefits based on a simple rentier uh, styled uh, calculation, uh, loyalty in return for revenues. Let me stop here. Uh, thanks to Hisham and Larry for uh, putting this together, and thank you all for coming. Um, in most of my recent work, I've spoken about this graph here, which is put together by my friends uh, Amr Adli and Fatma Ramadan, uh, and it shows the unprecedented wave of strikes and other forms of workers' collective action that began in the late 1990s and continued uh, during and beyond the ouster of Hosni Mubarak. Uh, the pace of contentious action actually escalated after Mubarak's demise and peaked just before the military coup of July 3rd, 2013. Now the sharp decline that the graph oops, shows here, whoops, you're going in the wrong direction, that the graph shows here um, is a little bit uh, no, it doesn't want to do it. It's a little bit uh, misleading, and that's laser. yeah, that's all right. I'm I'm it. Uh, it's a little bit misleading, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, the hundreds of independent trade unions and the two independent trade union federations established after Mubarak's ouster, as well as the two most established labor-oriented NGOs, the Center for Trade Union and Worker Services, and the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights all actively supported the Tamarud movement and the July 3rd coup. Uh, only the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights and several human rights advocacy NGOs expressed public reservations about the transitional roadmap that was issued by interim president Adi Mansour on July 6th. No trade unions uh, expressed opposition. Kamal Abu Aita, who was the president of the Egyptian Federation of Independent Trade Unions, accepted an appointment as interim minister of manpower and migration and suggested that workers would abandon the strike weapon. Workers did seem to accept the military's call for national unity and strike action sharply diminished in the second half of 2013, although they remained at a historic high. So what you can see here is two different uh, sources of data, which is to say these are accurate by order of magnitude and not much more. Um, and they show you that the number of protests continued to escalate after Mubarak's ouster, but very sharp decline uh, after the military coup. Um, the data for 2014 and 2015 are uh, even more contradictory than the 2011, 12, 13 in part due to the proliferation of NGOs uh, who are gathering this data, which is a sure sign that uh, politics is not happening. People are gathering data in offices rather than doing politics. Uh, and there's no standard method for gathering information. The uh, groups that are gathering the data don't tell you exactly where it's coming from, so there's no way to compare either from one year to the next or from one source to the next. But again, the order of magnitude um, is, is roughly accurate, and uh, even the most conservative figures here are twice the level of workers' collective actions of any year in the entire decade before Mubarak's ouster. So if we are looking at uh, the social movement, it's actually more intense now than it was in the lead up to Mubarak's ouster. Now, there was uh, a sharp increase uh, in uh, the first quarter of 
2014, especially February, we can see enormous uh, jump, because uh, in uh, September of 2013, uh, the new regime uh, announced that it would implement a 1,200 pound a month basic monthly minimum wage for all public sector workers. But uh, in January, when the new minimum wage was supposed to go into effect, uh, it turned out that it applied only to civil servants, that's six or seven million uh, people that uh, Amr mentioned, uh, but not to the public business sector or any other public employees. Um, so they promptly went on strike, and you had in the January, February, March, perhaps uh, 100,000 workers uh, on strike. Uh, Hazem uh, Bablawi's uh, government resigned. The cabinet was reshuffled. Uh, Kamal Abu Eita was ousted uh, as Minister of Manpower and Migration. Uh, and from then on, uh, the regime has uh, sharply attacked uh, all forms of independent trade unionism. That is, uh, all unions that are not under the aegis of the Egyptian Trade Union Federation, which was established in 1957 and which is essentially uh, an arm of the regime. What you can see, though, in uh, 2014 is that uh, even with a somewhat diminished level of uh, strike and protest activity, that the profile is the same. Um, the largest form of protest is strikes, and this is a trend that emerged in the mid-2000s. More militant and more intense uh, forms of protest and longer strikes than historically. You can also see that the reasons for protest continued more or less as they were uh, in the 2000s. 58% of the demands were about economic demands. Most typically, workers didn't receive an annual profit-sharing bonus or some other form of bonus or allotment that they were due. 11% um, over job security, that means uh, contingent and temporary workers are demanding to be appointed to full-time regular positions. And only 1% demanding union representation because at this point, uh, most of the private sector firms have made it clear that anybody who tries to organize a trade union uh, will be fired. Uh, and uh, so there's hardly any point to uh, make this demand. You lose your job and the regime uh, doesn't offer any protection. What is new in 2014, although it didn't begin then, uh, is the shift in the sectors that are protesting. So 42% of protests in 2014 are by post-secondary degree holders, and in some cases, uh, holders of advanced degrees. So 14% in the medical care uh, sector, 19% civil servants. That means for the most part that they have university degrees. Um, and so teachers uh, and faculty, uh, staff, 6%. So you still have a hardcore 25% factory workers, but uh, more and more of the protest is uh, coming from white collar uh, sector and from uh, advanced uh, degree holders. So 2015, because the year just ended and the organizations haven't translated their reports into English, so I have to present it uh, here in Arabic. Um, so uh, January is over on this end because you read uh, Arabic from right to left. Um, so this is one uh, source of data. 1,150 uh, 1, uh, collective actions for the first three quarters of uh, 2015. If you break them down by quarter, and they are very creative in their use of color and pie chart and all of this, so you can tell that they are spending lots of time doing stuff which is of no real importance, mm -hmm. but they do provide the data. Um, so if you break it down by a quarter, you see, again, 37% post-secondary degree holders, although still factory workers are a, a very important component of what's going on here but teachers, civil servants, uh, health sector, uh, and so on. The second quarter, same uh, rough distribution, 
79% post-secondary degree holders. Um, so factories, uh, again, uh, very strongly represented, but the medical sector, the education sector, um, the government employees, the civil servants, uh, and there's education up there. So uh, very uh, steady presence of white collar workers uh, throughout 2014 and 2015. Uh, and uh, same thing in the third quarter, there was a little bit of a jump, and this has to do with uh, teachers that I'll talk about um, in, in a minute. Um, but here, um, you, you can see that uh, civil servants, medical sector, uh, education sector, far out, and media far outweigh factory workers. Um, and some of this represents specific areas in which the regime has tried to uh, press on society uh, beyond the question of containing politics, but simply uh, bringing people into line, uh, so uh, censoring the media, uh, repressing the legal profession, uh, refusing to the medical uh, community's demands for changing the budget priorities to give the semblance of uh, adequate medical care and similar demands uh, by teachers. So in the uh, second half of 2015, despite the general decline, but still I want to insist workers' protests remain at a very high level by historic standards. But despite the general decline, you have several uh, important uh, innovations. An organization of unemployed MA and PhD holders was formed and has been holding weekly demonstrations uh, since uh, August uh, 2015. Uh, the sign here says, uh, master's degree in microbiology, uh, a faculty of Sciences, unemployed, um, and the, uh, the kusa, the, the, the zucchini is the uh, term for, uh, I, I don't have any uh, poll, I don't have any, yeah, no, I don't have any poll with the government, so that's why I'm uh, unemployed. The civil ser servant, the law governing civil service was changed um, in ways that are almost too complicated to understand, but I just read this morning an article by Fatma Ramadan where she lays out who will be harmed and why. Uh, this was the biggest demonstration since the military coup, about 5,000 people demonstrating against the new law on August 10th, 2015. Um, teachers also uh, demonstrated, and uh, this I would call the most political demonstration uh, of 2015, because not only are the teachers demanding uh, salary increases, but the poster says uh, we demand the resignation of the Minister of Education because of his management failures. Uh, so this language of calling political failure corruption ha is part of what uh, Amer spoke about, I think, of ridiculing politics. Uh, it's, it's not understandable to formulate that in a more political way. So uh, according to question. Democracy Index, a third uh, body providing uh, information, and uh, they are, uh, of course, uh, just to make it easy, going from January to December from left to right, not from right to left, um, there were 1,117 protests for all of 2015, but if you compare that um, to the earlier figure I showed you, this figure looks like it's on the low side, but I don't know why, who, the, who they're exactly uh, talking about here. In any case, uh, the Mahrusa Center, which had the higher figure for the first three quarters uh, of 2015, missed, of course, all the protests of the last quarter, and there were many, very, very large ones. Uh, the Mahala of Kobra, the uh, Mr. Spinning and Weaving uh, Company, has been at the vanguard of workers' protests for most of the last 15 years. 
they went on strike. They were joined by uh, another large uh, group of textile workers in Kafra Dawar outside Alexandria. And these are just in December and early January, the main strikes. Uh, we are talking here about uh, altogether probably 30,000 workers. So um, that's the numbers. And there are, if you'll give me an extra minute, uh, a couple of issues beyond the data problematic as it is. Uh, first, there's no doubt that the independent trade union movement has been seriously set back by attacks of the regime. Uh, as I mentioned, people who tried to organize unions were uh, fired, people have been arrested, beaten, and so on. The independent trade unions and federations themselves have very, very few resources. All of this organizing was done on, um, on a shoestring. Most importantly, uh, there is continuing lack of coordination with the oppositional intelligentsia beyond the two main uh, NGOs that have been engaged in labor activity, um, the Center for Trade Union and Worker Services uh, since 1990 and the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights uh, since late 2009. Several other NGOs uh, play a role in labor issues and sign on to various things. Um, the New Woman Foundation is an important one, the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, another one. But basically, this enormous continuing wave of labor protest is happening almost in a different universe than what most Egyptians in, who would consider themselves in any way oppositional call politics. And that's not only because the regime would like it to be that way, it's both because workers distrust politics, because they distrust the arrogance, what they see to some high degree properly, I think, as the arrogance and manipulation of political parties uh, centered in Cairo. And that means that insofar as political issues are addressed, they are addressed as corruption, uh, they are addressed as a uh, standard of living, but there is no critique of the regime's overall economic policy, which is to uh, pretty much continue the IMF, World Bank, Washington consensus uh, policies that uh, were an important factor underlying the uprising that ousted Mubarak in 2011. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I'm going to begin by actually um, offering up a theoretical puzzle and then try to think about Egypt as a location where we might examine this question. And that's the, the question of what happens to members of a former political elite during periods of rapid and uncertain political change. So um, some of us who are Egypt followers have written about that class of individuals that Amr referred to, the sort of business and entrepreneurial class, a corrupt class of people who are true beneficiaries of the Mubarak regime. What happened to these guys after Mubarak's ouster, and what implications uh, does their existence in the political scene have for um, the current regime? So we know these political elites, even when they're not in power, they carry important political know-how. They have mo mobilizational potential. Um, and in some cases, they have the desire and capacity to represent not only their personal interests, but the interests of their constituencies. So we can think about um, what happened to some of these members of the political elite during different periods. First, the, the period of SCAF rule. And then we can look at what happens during uh, Morsi's presidency and then pivot to uh, their position under Sisi. So uh, we know that immediately following Mubarak's abdication of political power, that the SCAF basically dissolved parliament, um, suspended the constitution, and we see two main trends regarding these political elite during that time. First, the SCAF was very cognizant of public unhappiness with this class of corrupt political leaders um, and sought to try to punish some of the most popular, or most unpopular and prominent ones um, through the legal process. And many of these guys were members of the National Democratic Party. So examples of these convictions are, are many. Um, so Ahmed is just one week after the collapse of the Mubarak regime. 
Um, and we know he was a very close um, associate of both uh, Gamal and Hosni Mubarak, was taken into custody for uh, prosecution of illegal acquisition of a steel company, and his assets were frozen. We know Zakaria Azmi, who was the presidential chief of staff, was also a very close associate of Mubarak, um, was convicted of abuse of authority and illegal profiteering. Um, a number of Mubarak-era cabinet members were also prosecuted for crimes. This includes the minister, former ministers of tourism, transportation, housing, media, finance, trade and industry. Some of these guys fled the country and were tried um, in absentia. Um, these prosecutions also extended to key members of the um, NDP party who were not cabinet holders. Now, I think what's important about this is that although these guys were targeted for prosecution, um, this really had more of a symbolic value than anything else. And in many cases, um, the legal case brought against them was actually quite weak. And I think that one thing we might be able to infer from this is that it provided an opportunity for many of them to appeal, uh, ways for sentences to get decreased, and for some ways for these guys to, um, in a sense, get off the hook for the illegal profiteering that happened uh, during the Mubarak period. Now, the second major trend um, related to the revival of political party life. So we know that in April of 2011, um, the Supreme Administrative Court ruled that the NDP was disbanded. So you have all of these guys who were once part of this hegemonic political party that was so dominant um, in its control of parliament and other political institutions. Um, but the SCAF quickly adopted a new political party law that gave um, the possibility for new parties to be established. And these former NDP members really took this as an opportunity to start to create lots of new parties. So we know Hossam Badrawi created uh, the Ittihad Party, the Union Party. Um, there was a Freedom Party established by the Hassan brothers. Um, there was the Egyptian Citizens Party. Um, Mohammed Raghib was involved with that. And then there were just many, many, many political parties that were established um, in this period. So to say that these guys sort of completely left political life, um, you know, it was simply not the case. They sought out opportunities to continue to remain engaged in politics. Now, the um, first parliamentary elections that took place after um, Mubarak's ouster were uh, the 2011-2012 parliamentary elections. And this was an opportunity to see how they were going to both, both participate in politics, but also to see how the public was going to respond to them. So one of the first um, big statements that comes out from the Muslim Brotherhood after the candidate uh, registration forms need to be completed um, is basically saying, these guys can't run for office. They shouldn't be permitted to participate in politics because they're basically criminals associated with the former regime. So um, in November, November 10th of 2011, the Mansoura Administrative Court bans all of these NDP guys from running for election. But it's only a few days later that the Supreme Administrative Court overturns that and saying that stripping anyone of the right to participate in political life represents an attack on rights that are protected by the Constitution. So they're back in business. They're able to run. Now, uh, civil society actually pushes back against these elites in a way that the courts do not. Um, and in a sense, there's a massive grassroots movement to try to identify people known as the Felul, the remnants of the old regime. And so there were Facebook pages um, sort of identifying who these guys were. Um, there were attempts to try to um, identify on every party list in every constituency which individuals were members of the old regime, what their relationship to the Mubarak's was. And this negative campaign actually turned out to be to be pretty effective. Um, of course, the old elites push back in their own way. So Badrawi, for example, says, you know, most, if not all of the party's members, um, of his party's members came from the NDP and not all NDP were corrupt. Um, others said that it's a complete injustice to consider all NDP deputies as opportunistic um, and that many of these people um, advocated for the ideals of democracy, freedom, not to mention calling for innovation and economic modernity. So um, there was an attempt to try to maintain a relevance in the political sphere. But um, of course, as we all know, the Falul performed very badly in that election. And so in many ways, the um, public grassroots attempt to identify, to name and shame uh, was pretty effective. Now, in April of 2012, um, something called the Political Isolation Law was passed by the Parliament and approved by the SCAF. And this prohibited people who served in a senior position in the Mubarak regime um, from the last 10 years to participate in politics uh, for, the, for the decade that followed. Um, but the Supreme Constitutional Court actually declared that this law was unconstitutional on grounds that it prevented citizens from engaging their uh, constitutional rights to um, participate in politics or to be uh, basically charged as criminals without having gone through legal criminal procedure. 
And this paved the way for Ahmed Shafiq to run for president in the um, May-June 2012 presidential elections. And as you know, um, he was defeated by the Muslim Brotherhood candidate, Mohamed Morsi. Now, um, Mohamed Morsi, uh, you know, of course, was ousted only a year after he was elected um, to office. And um, I think there's a growing consensus that business elites played a large role in the ouster of Morsi. And one manner, one way in which this happened was through their support for uh, independent media that was highly critical of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, um, a lot of the media reports about the role of business in helping to oust Morsi, I think, are, are unconfirmed and um, kind of live in the, the realm of rumor. But, uh, you know, one of the stories that sort of circulates is that someone like Nagib Suarez would meet with Sisi and basically say that I provided the men, the money, the influence um, to oust Morsi, and now I want some protections from things like um, expropriation of my business interests. And uh, the businessmen who are operating in Suarez's circles, um, in some cases it's been rumored, have been ordered to send their capital overseas to places with lower tax rates, try to get it out of the reach of the state or the military. Um, and there's also a rumor that they were actually told to burn their businesses down to try to bankrupt the insurance sector, um, also in an attempt to kind of close down the size of the, the pie that might be um, taken by, by the regime. So I think that the relations between um, the business elite and the new uh, regime are not totally transparent. And I, I do believe they are part of an alliance in the way that Amr had described. They are a pillar of this current government, but um, not in a way that I think is totally, uh, they, their interests are not totally aligned. And so there are some tensions that are quite important. Um, one of the uh, areas of tension is related to the mega projects. So these large infrastructural projects like the Suez Canal Development Project are administered to a, to a large degree by the military, but many of the subcontractors who benefit from this um, are, are private businesses. And often these are not um, the the subcontracts are not um, open tenders where anyone can submit. They're often executive order given to different private businesses. So, um, you know, there's there's some mutual uh, set of interests that's drawing them together, but uh, there's also a belief that maybe these mega projects are not actually good for a lot of business interests in Egypt. They have the sort of propaganda quality that Nancy talked about. And um, Nagib Sowetis, for example, has been reportedly um, criticizing the Suez Canal Development Project, arguing uh, the government hadn't done its due diligence in researching the costs or the economic implications of the project. Um, private sector interests are also unhappy about increases in fuel prices. They're unhappy about a 10% tax on stock market proceeds, as well as a 5% increase in taxes on the highest income individuals in the country. Right. So the CC government has not been doing um, basically everything it could to pander to these interests in the way Mubarak had. And so uh, there does seem to be a little bit of a disconnect. Um, some of you may have also heard about this Long Live Egypt development campaign, which was Sisi's attempt to try to get people, business and otherwise, to contribute to Egypt's development future. Um, he's, you know, basically crowdsourcing, um, economically crowdsourcing some of the uh, country's development needs. Um, and it seems as though business contributions to those types of enterprises or exercises has been declining over time. So we might think about this as one indication of the business community's confidence in um, how well they'll be represented in the, the new government. Um, the 2015 parliamentary elections are very interesting in that they represent in many ways a resurgence of old interests, right? So I said 2011-2012, uh, the old guard, the Falul, did not do well. But if you look at the people who won in this election, many of them um, are actually the sons and daughters of people who used to be in parliament, right? So it isn't necessarily that the same people are running but this break actually provided an opportunity for structural uh, or generational um, handing over of power within the broader set of elites. Um, so to summarize, um, the regime insiders who were tied specifically to Mubarak and Mubarak's sons were prosecuted to some degree, but again, in, in this kind of weak way that um, gave them opportunities for appeal and ways for these uh, convictions to be overturned. But those insiders who weren't as closely tied to the Mubarak's themselves 
um, they never really disengaged from politics. They were always sort of figuring out where their avenues of opening might be, what kinds of political party uh, participation they might engage in. They were kept down in 2011, 2012, but they've really come back, I think, in a very meaningful way in the new parliamentary elections. Um, finally, these business interests um, that seem to have been so key to Morsi's ouster, it's not totally clear that their interests are com completely consistent with those of, um, of President Sisi. And so this might provide a kind of window into um, where there is a kind of crack in the armor of this current regime. And, um, you know, something that I think as Egypt watchers were all sort of attuned to looking at where there may be some um, tension uh, within the regime and places where they may have some political vulnerabilities. Well, uh, thank you, Larry. And uh, thank you, everybody. I'm, um, I should start off by mentioning that I'm very delighted to be um, or to join this company of very distinguished um, friends and colleagues in thinking out loud about where political and social realities stand in Egypt today, especially as we approach the, first, the fifth anniversary of the January 25th uh, uh, revolution. Uh, and also as the manager of the organizing program, I should also mention that I'm very pleased to see that this important discussion is happening here at the Arab Reform and Democracy Program, uh, and also to see so many members of the Stanford and Bay Area communities join us and be part of this conversation. So what I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about today is the state of the ruling coalition that emerged in the aftermath of the July 3rd, 2013 coup. Uh, at the present moment, that coalition can be usefully conceptualized as this partnership between uh, various bureaucratic interests entrenched inside of the Egyptian state, most notably uh, the army, the domestic security establishment, uh, along with various intelligence uh, and security agencies, the judiciary, uh, along with, uh, of course, a variety of private business interests. And at a certain mo a moment in time, as um, uh, Nancy uh, kind of alluded to earlier, and as Lisa mentioned, uh, you know, there were certain civilian political uh, actors who were involved in that coalition, uh, liberals, leftists, Nasserists, and even Salafi political groups. But it's fair to say that over the course of the past three years, or two and a half years, uh, that dimension of uh, the ruling coalition has been completely marginalized and silenced. And the dominant force inside of the ruling coalition really is the state's uh, coercive institutions. So uh, I would argue that the most important and distinctive aspect of that ruling coalition is the increasing competition between its bureaucratic elements, especially between its uh, security and uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, that uh, is often very apparent in the way uh, or uh, very apparent in the uh, public campaigns and, and counter campaigns between uh, media personnel uh, affiliated with various intelligence agencies. More recently, that was very apparent in uh, the aftermath of the parliamentary elections and the fact that many pro-regime politicians and uh, various media figures uh, loyal to intelligence agencies uh, were divided about how to manage the majority bloc in parliament. Um, and at a certain level, this is not surprising. Uh, you know, these are uh, that form of competition is inherent to any form of bureaucratic politics. These are agencies that are co constantly competing over power, resources, and influence. Uh, and certainly, there's a long history of rivalries between these various agencies. For example, between uh, military intelligence and general intelligence, uh, or more generally, between the military and the domestic security establishment. Uh, but regardless of the specifics of these various rivalries, the fact that uh, that form of bureaucratic competition is pronouncing itself and uh, showing to the world the internal discord inside of the ruling coalition is something to be paused at and explained. And I would argue that uh, that seeming incoherence or that seeming fragmentation inside of the ruling coalition uh, speaks to the reality that the Egyptian state still has not recovered from the collapse of the National Democratic Party in 2011. Uh, as we all know, the NDP had been the ruling party in Egypt throughout the Mubarak years and the late Sadat period. And uh, s uh, since the downfall of the NDP in the spring of 2011, it's fair to say that the uh, that successive Egyptian rulers have failed to provide an alternative institutional framework for uh, 
building consensus and managing conflict among uh, members of the ruling coalition uh, to uh, distribute rents and resources to various members of the governing elite and to communicate with supporters and to keep them in line with some sort of official policy. The uh, regime or the political leadership of the military-sponsored regime has been failing miserably in that area. The president, Abdel Fattah Sisi, has been extremely resistant and consistently resistant to the idea of uh, either building or allying himself with a clearly defined political organization. It could have something to do with the fact that uh, he, he is keen on avoiding attaching his own political fortunes to any specific political organization, or it might have something to do with the fact that he doesn't want to openly engage in picking winners and losers in the political arena and getting into the business of clearly delineating the lines between an official ruling establishment and an official political opposition. But whatever the reasons are, this is creating an environment that is leaving the field wide open for security and intelligence agencies to step in uh, to wage uh, serious and autonomous interventions uh, in politics and uh, sometimes in tensions with each other. I think Amr was alluding that, to that earlier, especially with regards to the parliamentary elections, the fact that you basically have a parliament that wasn't re uh, not really a multi-party elections, but really an election of a competition between uh, candidates that are sponsored between various uh, security and intelligence agencies. So this is, this is a new mode of politics that we need to pause at and to co contemplate. Um, so uh, what we're really having here is not, instead of, as opposed to uh, kind of a, a ruling party framework, what you really have is a, this neo-corporatist uh, system of rule with the president at the helm, and uh, under him are various powerful factions of the Egyptian state competing for power and influence. And uh, obviously, as mentioned earlier, the most important, the most significant of these factions are the security and intelligence agencies. And... Um, Within this context, I think the role of the president can be usefully understood as the arbiter of conflicts between the most important factions inside of the ruling coalition. Uh, and um, he's constantly relying on uh, his promotions, reshuffles, uh, the distribution of rents and benefits, or even in some cases kind of diplomatic or, or uh, kind of softening uh, public proclamations and statements in order to ensure some kind of stable balance of power between those various factions. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, another important feature or another important implication of that uh, structure of rule or that uh, mode of, of governance um, is the fact that it leaves a great deal of room for incoherence and indecision, and that it leaves a great deal of room for the conflicts between the various factions of the Egyptian state to play themselves out publicly. Uh, and uh, obviously the most recent uh, example that we were talking about earlier is the uh, outcome of the parliamentary elections and the fact that uh, there was a great deal of confusion over how uh, the political actors and coalitions or the pro-regime political actors and coalitions to be more specific um, who secured representation in parliament uh, would organize uh, in that new legislature following the election. Uh, so what is the takeaway from all of this? The takeaway is that this conventional and dominant view that the authoritarian regime that existed under Hosni Mubarak is somehow uh, re-emerging and re-establishing itself it does not quite capture the complexities and the realities of post-coup Egypt. Uh, I think what we're having here is a new mode of authoritarian politics that is struggling to define itself, that is struggling to emerge, and whose consolidation remains uh, very much a work in progress. So what is going to happen to, uh, kind of within that complex picture, what is going to happen to this seemingly volatile equilibrium, how it's going to evolve and develop, is something that remains to be seen, and perhaps something that we can discuss further in the Q&A session. So I'm going to leave it here and open this up for discussion. <laughs> ألوان عالم إيران قربت لقيت مصرية وكتبة إحنا اللي بنتهام شب بيعزف عود شب بيعزف عود بأصابع خارجية تلاقي كتب النوتة في أجندة دولية قربت لقيته بيعزف أغاني الشيخ إمام ويرد عليه الشعب يريد إسقاط النظام